Well, welcome. My name is Ray James. I'm the uh, Acting State President of New South Wales, and uh, for those who don't know who I am, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. The toilets, the heads are just around the corner here, so at the door here to the left, and you'll see the signs down there to the toilets. Um, everybody signed in, and we've done the COVID-19 checks and balances. All good. Okay, well today's about the, um, I'll just do a prelude in, in relation to the strategic plan and John Black will be up shortly to, to uh, present the plan and uh, go through the slideshow and, uh, and those who haven't got a handout, there's some over there on the table. Um, anyway, it's about, um, about the RSL, New South Wales, we all, we all share the responsibility and we need to, to move forward. So, and it's about the RSL, New South Wales being one RSL, not 348 sub-branches or individual sub-branches in New South Wales doing their own thing. So without RSL New South Wales working as one, uh, we'll not survive as a veteran charity into the immediate future. Without the changes that are proposed in the strategic plan, all evidence points to a continued decline in our membership and failing relevance and dwindling community standing. Our current membership as of June 2020, without going through the break up, but in, in relation to service members, we've got 22,135 service members currently in New South Wales RSL sub-branches. That's a member organisation, not member benefit. We'll come back to that. But since 2018, we've lost 4,182 service members. Our average age is 76, 77. So where we're going to be in another five years or even another ten years. And with, the, with those statistics we're looking at it probably won't be a member based organisation in 15 to 20 years. So there's a big need for strong support from all the members in the RSL and for the leadership to stand up in every sub-branch. We need to deliver our charitable purpose and not working independently. We need to, ch to deliver that as one, as one RSL. At Congress in 2019, those who were there or should have got their delegates report when they got back, we voted for a constitution, which was a huge step forward. And the delegates at Congress also unanimously agreed for RSL New South Wales to remain a member-based organisation and to remain a charity and also it needed to implement a strategic plan. We must also understand that as a member of a charity, we as members cannot get a benefit. As a veteran in need, we can get assistance, either financial or physical, physically, i.e. if we have funeral funds, as sub-branches have, some have and some haven't, membership fees and other benefits to that such, the ACNC has identified as benefits and as a member organisation, as a charity, we cannot receive a benefit. We have over decades grown apart. Some of the more financial sub-branches have over years helped less fortunate sub-branches, particular, particularly in the rural areas. And that's great. However, there's no checks and balances during this process which are required by the various government regulators. That is where our support fund in town comes in. Financial support to sub-branches can then be distributed to those sub-branches who show that they are in a financial need. They can obtain that financial support and in return those sub-branches who su support the support fund will be identified in President's and Secretary's updates and also on the website showing exactly where that dollar has gone and where it's been spent. Remembering that as a charity we must show the regulators where the charitable dollar has gone, where it has been spent. And the, and the purpose, our purpose, is to looking after all veterans and their families, not just RSL sub-branch members, all veterans in the community receive, a he receive help from our charity. There's been a continued doubt of legitimacy in trust in Anzac House that comes from some disaffected people trying to persuade others that the past is okay. 
but we had a judicial inquiry that said the past wasn't okay. So we need to stop the negatives in our, in our organisation and move forward. We need to ask the question of each other, what do we stand for? Shouldn't we have a plan to enable future generations of veterans to engage, get involved and assume leadership roles to perpetrate our heritage and what we stand for in our communities? Why do we have to be negative all the time? Why can't we seize the opportunity for the future now before it's too late? If we implement this plan now, we will, you will be surprised what will happen. People will want to join the organisation Join an organisation that likes having fun while helping others in need and can lead the way forward. We need to invigorate the League with new generation of members and renewed focus on using our combined leadership and resources to once again be the premier charity for veterans and their families. Society is changing all the time and we need to keep up with the changes. That has been our problem. We've taken our eye off the ball, so to speak, and that's because we are not one RSL, we're all individuals. We need to embrace this opportunity to be strong for the future of the RSL. Other ESOs do more in this space of camaraderie, being that having barbecues, fun outings, being at picnics, race days, attending town and village events, organising sporting events between each other, and outings for their veterans and their families. And we can do that, we can do the same. And some sub-branches are doing that, but not all sub-branches. But when we do that in our local sub-branch area, we've got to invite all veterans in that community to also join, whether it be bus trips to the Australian War Memorial or whatever. It's not just for the sub-branch members, it's for all veterans. And that helps with the recruitment of new members for the RSL to continue the league in the future. Other ESOs have evolved because for so long, we, the RSL, have lost our way from what our forefathers had intended. And this was evident after the Vietnam War, where the RSL treated Vietnam veterans poorly. Hence, the Vietnam Veterans Association Australia came out and looked after veterans. Today's veterans are feeling the same, and therefore other ESOs are evolving. Some 450 in New South Wales alone, such as Soldier On, Swiss Eight, Afghanistan Veterans, Wounded Warriors, just to name a couple. Again, we have become a member benefit organisation for members of the RSL, which is not the charitable purpose, and not looking after all veterans in the community. So they start their own ESOs. We know that younger veterans want to join an organisation that does things with their families and not just attend meetings. So do we really need to have many meetings? So many meetings. Maybe every second meeting could become a barbecue for the family of veterans. Also, younger veterans don't know the difference between the RSL sub-branch and the RSL club. That's another hurdle we need to address. And slowly we are, through various media channels, be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, along with the website. And John will cover some of that and some experience that we've had on the road recently. I can tell you that all that both Anzac House staff and the board have changed. Anzac House staff has decreased from some 60 plus in 2019 down to 19 from July this year and still have to do what they have to do. The board makeup now is totally different than ever in its history, in its 100 years history. Three quarters of the board have jobs, they are younger and, they, and some of them have jobs, uh, sorry, have, are, on, are working jobs and also on other boards. And they hold positions of senior executive in business in business as well as other companies. We also have two independent directors now, as per the judicial inquiry and a part of the Act, and that tightens up our governance and our compliance issues that was found seriously lacking in our organisation. We also must remember all our sub-branches are unincorporated and the responsibility lies with both the board and the trustees of the sub-branches. Anzac House has changed its operational, operational structure and governance and compliance, but have the 348 sub-branches done the same? You've got to ask yourself that question. Your current board is working as one. There are no factions within the board. The board is working with Anzac House staff to deliver services and to help the sub-branches together as one, as one RSL. And we need to work together and the required changes to meet the governance and compliance requirements 
right down the line to the, to the sub-branches. At national level, the RSL, the RSL, the board, is working towards one RSL Australia. Currently, there is a robust debate happening re national strategic plan. There is some tidying up of certain trusts. The ACNC compliance have given some 19 items on their matrix to, to complete. 17 of those have been completed. There are two to go. They're to do with KPIs for each strategic objective and the board agendas need to be realigned. Conflict of interest is another issue with national as it is with state. The Australian board charter also is, need to be renewed and the, Australian con the RSL Australia constitution. So lots happening there as well. So it's not just happening in our state. We need to invigorate the league with a new generation. New generation of members and a renewed focus on using our combined leadership and resources to be a premier organisation for veterans and their families. The purpose of the strategic plan is necessary to move us forward over the next five years. And as I've already mentioned, we need to show the ACNC that we have implemented the plan as we did the constitution. However, the plan needs funding and the plan and a plan to fund the strategic plan requires all sub-branches to help in some way. The strategic plan has been on the RSL New South Wales website for several months and feedback from the members is very important, as is the response of that feedback given back to them. It's all on the website and I encourage everybody to have a look at it. I'll leave there any questions to me and John until after John's finished his uh, presentation. But, um, yeah, John, all yours. Uh, thank you, Rates. It's, it's great to be with you this afternoon. Uh, a small group, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the whole process is about engagement and receiving feedback. As Ray said, the strategic plan is around the future of the RSL in New South Wales, uh, but we've got one eye on the national agenda as well because the RSL is a national organisation. Uh, the badge that uh, a number of you wear uh, proudly is a national organisation. Nonetheless, this plan is focused on New South Wales. And as Ray said, it's about how do we set a tone for the future, about reinvigorating an organisation that is 100 years old, steeped with history and tradition, but at the same time, how do we mobilise all the resources we have for the purpose, and that is to help veterans in need. So this session is uh, interactive. It's not about me uh, talking or presenting per se, it is about receiving feedback because as Ray suggested, this can't be a plan of the board, it can't be the plan of the executive of Anzac House, it needs to be the members plan. And, and what we need to make that happen is feedback from members. The feedback so far, as Ray said, is on the website. Uh, generally speaking, when we speak to the membership, which was a lot easier before COVID, I might say, it was generally very positive about the future. They recognised the strengths of some of the initiatives in the plan to address what we're seeing as the threats. But what I'm seeing is uh, through the most recent consultations that have been restricted because of the COVID thing is that the feedback uh, from the membership is not necessarily reflected by the leadership of the 340 odd sub branches who in themselves uh, believe that the feedback that they can provide will be listened to, which it will. Uh, but at the same time, I'm seeing a difference between the feedback I receive at a session such as this and what I'm receiving in writing uh, from a sub-branch. So that's why this member engagement is so important. So how do we actually know what the members are thinking and beyond the membership group, also the potential members of the organisation, those that are currently serving or those that have served in the uh, Defence Forces. I think everyone be understanding why we need a strategic plan. It's not just about compliance and governance, it's about setting the tone for our investment in the future. The organisation, as I said, has been steeped in history and tradition. But why have so many other charities all of a sudden appeared to look after veterans? You have to ask why. When we have 
an RSL, a proud RSL that had the history and the tradition of supporting all veterans in need through all our conflicts and wars. Ray mentioned the trouble with the Vietnam War, people returning and the resistance of welcoming people into the RSL. We've got to get beyond that and into the future because it is about looking after others. It is a charity and the charity's purpose is to look after veterans and their families. Not look after members, but to look after veterans. There has been, I think, from my perspective, a, a long period of introspection and that is initiated through judicial inquiries, uh, at the same time an inquiry by the regulator about the behaviour of the charity, but it only looked at the head office. It didn't look at the substantive part of the charity across all the sub-branches. We can't afford to look behind without looking where we're going, so that's why this plan is essential for the future. I will uh, go through a brief overview of the plan, just highlight from a conceptual point of view where it's taking us, but then I want to get some feedback. But what you think, uh, the strengths or weaknesses, what should we be thinking about to include in the plan so we can do so? Now that brings me to the schedule. Uh, initially, and the dates you will see in the draft plan are all about implementation starting last month. And that was all predicated on the fact that we wouldn't have COVID-19 and the roadshow consulting would have been finished in May uh, with the final plan presented to the board in July. Now, obviously we can't, so the plan now is the board has asked me to come back in October, which is at the end of October, not only with the final plan, but I need to explain to the board how we're going to fund the plan. The funding is approximately based on this draft, around $23 million over five years and all the detail is on the website. Right, let me uh, explore a little bit about the plan in outline. Now, it is on the website, and I know a number of you have got the uh, copy of the plan with you. So, the website is easy to use, and you can get into the website as the copies of the strategic plan how to provide the feedback into the strategic plan. Members' views so far, as Ray said, the strategic plan budget, if you wanted to get in here, and there's a few of you who need to get your glasses out and expand that, but you can see each of the initiatives and where they're actually being scheduled over what period of time and how much they cost, which understandably is, is a key, uh, obviously, requirement for us to be able to fund a plan. There's no point having a plan unless we can resource it. So, I'll just go back up to the top and open a copy of the plan. Now there is uh, what I call the, the main plan here, which is in colour, and then there's the CFO version, and that means it's uh, budgetary constrained, so it's a black and white one and you can print it out at less cost. But let me open up the colourful one, and you can see it there. Now, there's a couple of points that Ray mentioned that I need to emphasise before diving in, though. Uh, Two important assumptions were validated at the Congress of RSL New South Wales last October. And I started in this job in September. So I was very much the new boy on the block, um, but I wanted to understand from the audience around what they needed that was sacrosanct for this plan. And as Ray mentioned, there were two things that we were able to validate by unanimous vote at the Congress. And that is that we wish to remain member-based organisation and we want to remain a charity. And as Ray pointed out, that in itself is a challenge in the modern world of compliance and oversight because the rules of the land today, unlike in 1916 when the RSL was established, hand in hand with a club, in today's world a charity by itself is not able to provide benefits to a member of the charity. So an example that came out through the Bergen inquiry, but more particularly by the Australian Charities Not-for-Profits Commission was the Hyde Park Inn right behind me here, where traditionally as a member of the RSL, you could arrive there and get a big discount. Of course, the, the regulator said, you can't do that. That's a benefit for a member. But now when you check in and current serving people, you can say, I'm a veteran, you can get a benefit. 
So the challenge for us is that a lot of service members, of course, are veterans. Someone who's served in the ADF. So from time to time, that person might require support from the charity, and that is legitimate. And the other thing we need to point out, I think importantly, is the camaraderie, one of the great strengths of the RSL historically, that is mates getting together, sharing stories, feeling good about each other, supporting each other, that's legitimate too, within constraints. So that's two very important underpinning things from Congress. The other thing I took away from Congress was there was no trust in the strategic leadership of the RSL in New South Wales. Now, I mentioned about the judicial inquiry you know, through 2017 and you know, front pages of newspapers with presidents being convicted of crimes. It's not good. But saying that, as Ray mentioned, we've got a new board, new direction, and to resolve the issue of transparency, that website behind me has such things as all the expenditure. It has the director's credit cards expenditure. Everything is on that site. And that's important to build trust and confidence in the organisation that it's being well managed. But it's more than that. That trust really epitomises what we need to do and what we stand for for the future. And that's what we want to build upon in terms of the plan. So the, the first two pages around the case for change um, is pretty powerful messages. Some of it's not easy reading, uh, particularly for long-term members of the League. We've talked about the age profile. If we want to remain member-based, we want to attract people into the charity to deliver the charitable purpose. But I'll come to what I think is the secret in perhaps the implementation on that. What do we stand for? Someone asks you in the elevator, what does the RSL stand for? We've got to be able to answer that question because that's what the community wants to know. Confusion with the brand, I mentioned about the club and the sub-branch. I, I was asked at the interview for this job, why didn't I join the RSL? Well, I thought the RSL was a club where you go and get a cheap beer, a palm in, I can pay the pokies. I didn't know the sub-branch, the charity, was separate. And it has been since the mid-1970s in New South Wales. But if you ask anyone in the street about the RSL, they will point to towards a club, a building with a branding that says RSL. So that's a challenge for us, but it's also an opportunity. We mentioned about the other service, ex-service organisations. All these other charities are competing for the dollar, but also competing for the attention about how they can support veterans in need. And they are penetrating current serving and more recently serving people through social media, through marketing and processes, particularly through social media. There's talks about leadership, it talks about the resource inequity. We've got some sub-branches in New South Wales that have $30 million invested. And we've got some sub-branches with nothing. Um, the other day, uh, Ray and I and our CFO were in Yas uh, for a consultation and we all just reached into our wallet to pick out 20 bucks to pay for dinner. Other sub-branches, you know, they can go on the harbour for a cruise and the sub-branches pay for the dinner on the cruise. So we've got you know, quite a lot of inequity across the organisation. Uh, it talks here about other states, uh, and that's a really challenging thing for us when we look at funding. Uh, there is some options the board is looking at, which is also on the website, around our structure in terms of the implementation of the plan. RSL Queensland's underpinned by approximately $70 million a year revenue from the lottery the art union, that's uh, tickets sold right across Australia. In fact, it's global now. And we've got to start to think about the benefits of that and how it supports veterans across Australia, but how does it support the RSL in New South Wales? So there's a whole series of things there. And then two pages of what we're gonna be looking like five years from now if we implement this plan. So that, of course, is not the case for change. but what success will look like. Now, I won't dwell too much on that at this moment because I'm going to do a bit of an overview of what the actual initiatives are. But needs to say, in, in five years from now, everyone who's serving in, in the ADF today 
when they leave, will want to get involved with the RSL because they're going to have a lot of fun and they're going to help those diggers and others in need. And that is a big change for us, but very doable in my view because that's the Australian way. Now, there's a page here where it talks about, whoops, losing control of my mouse, around the purpose and vision. I've had some feedback on this. It's a little bit complex and a bit wordy. We need to get to the nub of the issue, and I think the motto says it all. Uh, Ray said it, one RSL working together but delivering locally. There's absolutely no doubt the power and the strength of the organisation comes from some members and their associated sub-branches. So we can build on that strength and that's, that's in the plan. So there it is. So the plan, like uh, good strategic plans, we break the vision down. At the moment, in this draft plan, there's seven goals to achieve the vision. And you can read them there. Uh, it's interesting that there's some feedback say that it's too, too detailed. Other people have told them there's not enough detail. So we've got to get the balance right. But arguably, a strategic plan, you should be able to read it and say what we're we doing when and what are we going to achieve. Uh, and that's what we aim to do here. So pretty important that those girls. Now, values, I think, are very important. Younger people are looking for that in the organisation, not only understanding what the organisation stands for, but uh, how it behaves. What are those behaviours we expect from our members as part of a team? We all had them when we served. I had to have some feedback, and you can see it on the website, that some people believe that values are just motherhood statements and we don't need them. Well, I'm not so sure. Uh, because the younger people will be looking for, as I said, the organisation and what those are. I've had some feedback around that um, and I'd appreciate any more uh, feedback around the values. Now, there are seven goals and then each of the goals, there are 49 initiatives and what success will look like across that. So I won't go into those in detail, but what I'll do is go to a summary, graphically how it looks. If we were to implement those 49 initiatives. Now, it's not all the initiatives on this picture, but let me describe the concept of what we're talking about of the future of the RSL in New South Wales. At the top left, you can see a veteran who may or may not be in need, uh, but is seeking support or seeking companionship or mateship. You can see there that we've kept the clubs in the plan. There was some thought we could separate the clubs, tell them they can't use the RSL branding anymore and all that sort of stuff. But what we realise is that 100 years of history and understanding in the community, we're better off keeping them inside and working with the clubs. So if someone walks into a club and says, I'm a veteran, I need some help, someone will steer them directly to the sub-branch. Now, I can tell you, around my experiences with, with rain going around New South Wales for the last six months or so, is that some places I've walked into, and I say I'm a veteran in need, they say, oh, sorry, mate, can't help you. But it says Diggers Club. Oh, sorry, uh, that's, that's old. I'm not sure what it means. We can't have that. Because if someone does associate the RSL or Diggers Club or Memorial Club, Services Club with the services, we surely should be able to get a connection to what we need from the sub-branches. So as we can see across the top, the centre of the plan is the veteran and the family and how do we support them. Well, it's done, as I said, through the sub-branch. The sub-branch is at the centre of what we do. But there's some minor changes going to have to happen to make us relevant for the future. And they're in those four top dot points at the top there. So, I've mentioned the importance of camaraderie already. The next thing called events is probably going to become more prominent in the, the final version of the plan. By events, what do I mean? Well, this is around young people, as Ray mentioned, don't want to necessarily attend meetings, but they want to do stuff. So, for instance, when I was in Dubbo, um, I almost didn't get out of there alive when I suggested the best Anzac biscuits in New South Wales are made in Bombala. They said they make the best ones. And when I, when I was at uh, a, a sub-branch in, in near Wollongong, I mentioned that they had the best walking soccer team. 
I've mentioned to a younger veteran that uh, when she decided to join the YAS sub-branch, she said, I apologise, Don, I haven't been to a meeting. I said, don't worry about a meeting. I heard that YAS sub-branch are the road racing champions of the RSL in New South Wales. And she said, oh, do we do that? That's what people want to do. They want to get involved. And we want sub-branches to interact with other sub-branches so there will be activities and people want to join that because they can connect with other veterans in the community and make, make it a fun place to be part of. So that's about events and activities. And by the way, uh, we were going to kick off on this now and I was really pleased to see the Combined Services uh, Rugby team set up in Sydney in the Sydney Comp with veterans combining with current serving and they're having fun. That's fantastic and we've got to do more of that. Um, meetings, we've got to do that. We, as I mentioned, some sub ranches have got over $30 million they're managing. This is not an insignificant charity. Not an insignificant charity. So we've got to make sure we continue good governance and practices again, as Ray emphasised. The next stop point about concierge service is probably the biggest change uh, to where we are today. And a little bit of explanation there. In the plan detail, it talks about the requirements in today's world to have people qualified to give services, whether it's welfare, you've got to have a diploma. If you're going to provide services for pensions, you've got to do a course that requires an extensive amount of training and currency. And the expectations on volunteers to do that, we're finding is then putting too much stress and pressure and expectation, and also accountability on volunteers. And we are a volunteer organisation. So in majority, by far the vast majority of places I've been to, the sub-branches say, John, we can't sustain pensions work because I've got no one qualified now to do it under the new system. So it made you think around how do we do that in the future? And the future is that those professional services that require technical training and skilling will be delivered by full-time paid people generally. Not in all cases, but generally. And that's where you see on the diagram here the, the line on the page. And the brands there is just an example because you can see in the top, uh, sorry, at the centre at the bottom, it says other 450 other organisations are providing services for veterans. But what we're suggesting in the detail is that we require a catalogue of services to be developed and our sub-branch members become a sponsor. It might be a name that will change in the final version of the plan so that that person knows that catalogue back to front. And if someone's in need, someone who's joining or a veteran in the community, we can connect them to the services they need. We've got talking on the left um, about RSL veteran respite accommodation. Uh, we've discovered we've got around 60 holiday units owned by various sub-branches and maybe there's a way of better managing that so we can get veterans in need and their families to those respite accommodation opportunities. Fantastic locations up and down the coast. Um, and that's some of the sort of things we can work on in terms of services. Okay, the third dot point, and I'll probably mix that with the fourth dot point around commemoration. There's no doubt the history, the traditions of the RSL, the custodianship of commemorations, whether it's Anzac Day, Victory in the Pacific this week, Vietnam Veterans Day, these are really important commemorations and generally there's been an association between the RSL and that commemoration. We know there are other organisations, let's take Soldier On, on their website, they're proudly promoting that next Anzac Day they will conduct driveways at dawn, make a donation and you get a badge. We've got places around New South Wales where sadly the RSL doesn't have a footprint anymore, other people are stepping into that space for commemoration. So I think there's an opportunity for us to recognise how do we better perform that role collectively and support all the sub-branches right across New South Wales to make sure that we maintain that association. And why I want to link it with the fourth dot point is that generally fundraising today is so competitive with so many charities competing for the buck. So it's not so much the importance of going out and fundraising in the community. It's about connecting the badge and what we stand for to the commemoration and the people in the community seeing that. They connect RSL with commemoration and we've got to maintain that. So that community bearing around fundraising is important for that reason. 
the board's already made the decision that fundraising is important for sub-branches and everything raised in the sub-branch should be kept by the sub-branch, not taxed and sent to Anzac House. So those decisions have already been made. So that's around the fundraising financial support to local veteran services because each sub-branch has its own initiatives and we should continue that. There's some brilliant little local initiatives up in Nambucca, for instance, they've got a little set up there with the council around employment services and things like that. It can be done because of the type of people we are. So I think it's an exciting, exciting future around that. All right, so I mentioned, and this is probably the last point before we get into Q&A, how do we fund it? $23 million or thereabouts over five years. Now, at the back of the plan is the concept of a pooled funding model. I found out in my working life that you don't march on Moscow in winter. Uh, you don't try to introduce fluoride in the water supply in Queensland. You don't put an IT person in charge of an IT project. And you don't take the assets off an RSL New South Wales sub-branch. So this is about voluntary contributions to what I call the pooled funding model. And it really dawned on me last December when I attended a luncheon with what, who I thought was going to be the investment company. But as it turned out, there were 30 sub-branches in the room. And that investment company was thanking the sub-branches for their custom. But what I realised is each of those 30 sub-branches are paying a very large fee to the same advisor and funds manager and getting the same advice. So I thought, what happens if we all work together? And we pop it into the pool. So just a brief back of the cigarette packet type calculations is the amount of money we'll save on fees alone would enable us to employ at least another 10 pensions advocates. So that's a good thing. So how do we then convince people to say, we trust Anzac House, well, this is not about Anzac House, this is about us employing the right advisors, the right functions to do that. Remember, as Anzac House, we can't provide advice, we're not qualified to do so but we can procure the right advice to manage a pool fund. Now, what might come as a surprise to some of you is if we took all the cash objects that we have around all the sub-branches, it's around a quarter of a billion dollars. So if we invested that in a pool, and this is where the next part of the concept's important because the returns before going back to the investor needs to make a decision about strategic investment. And I mentioned the strategic plan, that might be one. We've got an initiative underway to have a full-time liaison officer at the National Centre for Veterans Health. That's another one. We could say, let's fund that. Let's fund other programs and initiatives before we return in, in returns to the investors. Of course, we need to make sure we keep growing the pool, in, certainly with inflation and above, to keep the value in the, in the pool. There has been some conjecture around adding property in, into the pool. I've said no at this stage, but there are some members of the District President's Council who wish to include that, um, and certainly we won't discourage that, but at the, main, the main focus is this pooled funding model. As I said at the start, uh, we go back to the board in October with a final plan, but unless we can work out how we can fund it, we don't have a plan. Uh, we've looked at all options of funding it within Anzac House, but for the last uh, three years prior to the financial we just completed, we're in large deficits, and we can't continue to do that, and that is not my advice to the board. I don't recommend at this stage selling the farm to pay for operations. I think we've got to be very careful about that, maintain the strength and treasure of our history, investing the, that wisely, and taking the returns to fund operations. That's what we're proposing.